Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody that made it out. Going to be looking at our bulletin, see what's going to be going on this week and for a little while in the future. We do have youth choir practice today at 5 p.m. Encourage all the youth that sing in the youth choir to be out there for practice. Of course, we have our Sunday night church tonight at 6. Christmas play practice after tonight's service, and that will be for everyone that's in the Christmas play. Um, and then we also have our ladies' prayer group Tuesday at 10.30 a.m., there will be no um, nursing home visitation this week. No nursing home visitation. Of course, we have our jam program on Wednesday nights and our adult Wednesday night um, Bible study as well, so remember those. Happy birthday wishes going out to, this week to Miss Jessica Griffith, whose birthday's on Wednesday. Also remember Miss Debbie Taylor, whose birthday's on Saturday. Um, also a reminder, our missions offering um, will be next Sunday. Oops, missions, I put, already put the plate out for this time. Oh, well, next Sunday, missions offering. Um, also, Christmas play. Uh, our Christmas play on our Christmas bank will be held on December 17th, and that's on Sunday night. Please bring your favorite dishes. That's both main dishes and side dishes, as well as desserts to share. Um, as far as the, the order of events that night, we are going to be having the Christmas play itself will be at 5 o'clock, um, and it runs right at an hour long. And then right after that, we'll be going over to the Christmas banquet, and it should start around 6 o'clock. Jam news. Jam Christmas party is coming up. If you'd like to help, please give $15 to Michelle or Daniel Dunn, and they will buy the presents and wrap them and give them out at the party. We want to thank Today's the last day to do it. Today's the last day, because party's Wednesday? Yep. Party's Wednesday, so if you can assist out, um, give that money to Miss Michelle, any amount would be appreciated. Also, um, give a memorial tribute to your loved ones. Buy and donate a poinsettia to be placed in the front of the church with their names. Uh, give them to Miss Jojo, the day's flowers. Diana Wallen for her parents, Jean and Jeff Harden. Sandra Meadows for her husband, Lawrence. Joel Bragg for sister, Nancy, my mother, um, the Taylors for mom, Elba Taylor, uh, brother Terry, br sorry, brother Jerry Taylor, and great nephew, Anthony Taylor. Appreciate all those and all those that have been coming in. I like this holiday wish list. If you hadn't read it, I like it. Um, less gifts, more memories. Less busyness, more peace. Less stress, more joy. Less chaos, more calm. Less excess and more gratitude. I like it. If we could wrap our head around that for the holiday, we'd be doing real good. And I'll read it, give it honor to it, might as well. <laughs> if it had been three wise women, they would have asked directions. <laughs> Arrived on time, Helped deliver the baby, cleaned the stable, made a casserole, and brought disposable diapers as gifts. <laughs> Gotta love it. <laughs> uh, I'll agree with most everything in there but the on time. <laughs> anyway. Other announcements this morning. No, do we have any testimonies or specials this morning? Uh, Terry? All right. 
we'll go on to our prayer request. Do we have any prayer requests starting on my right? Brother Bob? Okay. John? Seamus Allen. Terry? Okay, Miss Diane? Lynn? Okay. Okay, Bill? Yes, sir? Okay. Anyone left? Charlotte? Yes, him. Yes, him. Right in, in front. Okay. Okay. For your grandma. Okay. Continue to remember my brothers. Trying to get them to come to the Christmas play. And answer prayers. The lady I asked prayer for. Um, Carla Bragg, her surgery went well on her eye and the cyst, everything went well there. Um, a couple other prayer requests that, that I've had, um, people have had surgery, they've done well, so continue to remember them as they recover. Any unspoken requests by that raised hand? I got quite a few. This time I'd like to ask Brother Kenny if you would, at least in prayer, Brother Kenny. All right, have we had any anniversaries in the last week? No? Well, we'll have our song of dismissal and our birthday song. If you've had a birthday in the last week and like to come forward and celebrate with us, you're more than welcome. If not, everybody stand and sing number... 332. 332, if you stand, trust and obey. 332, let's sing a couple verses of this as we dismiss the young people. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust
trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust. On the last verse, and you young people are dismissed, then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by the side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. to trust. All right, you may be seated. Well, Josh is uh, going to preach uh, to us this morning, teach us this morning, and so uh, he, uh, his feet are almost on the ground. He got to spend a couple days with his uh, lady friend, and so we've been trying to hold him in. We had last night had to tie lead, uh, the cinder blocks to his feet just to keep him on the ground there. So anyway, we're very happy for him. I wanted to, uh, just to, as a to make the church aware on the 24th, which is Christmas Eve, uh, some folks have asked, you know, what are we doing? We're going to have church as normal. Um, and the morning service will be normal. And the night service, uh, we have a missionary to be with us morning and night. And so he'll preach for us in the morning. But the night service we're going to have for one hour long. We're going to open up with a song and then turn the service open over to him. This man and his wife are... I don't know how old he is. Maybe he may be 45-ish. Uh, they've ministered in the same place, uh, to my knowledge, ever since he graduated from uh, seminary. And uh, he and his wife now are leaving to go to Burma and to live there, to spend the rest of their life there, uh, to work. And I believe he's primarily going to be with the children's home. And so uh, it, it honors him, you know, if we, and honors the Lord for us just to listen yeah, I, I really desire for us to be involved. It's my desire for us to be involved in what he's doing. If you uh, haven't paid attention, there's just not much in, there's not many opportunities to support people going to Burma anyway. And a lot of it has to do with Burma's politics. There are things that are going on in Burma, thankfully, but there's just not a, a lot from the outside going in for us to be able to influence. And so it's a great opportunity for us. But just be in prayer. Uh, so Sunday morning normal, he'll be with us. But Sunday night, he's going to give all that to missions uh, for him to explain to us the work that God has for him. And, and uh, we're going to have uh, be there by to be able to pray for him and pray with him about his ministry. Okay? Okay, Josh, come on and uh, preach for us. All righty. 1 Samuel chapter number 13. 1 Samuel chapter number 13. Thank you once again for the opportunity. Okay. All right. Praise the Lord. Okay. I enjoy the opportunity to teach God's word, but I don't uh, enjoy the nerves that come with it. But First um, Samuel 13 in your, in your Bible, if you would. We're going to look at a story today and uh, just look really um, how some, some different people handled the same situation and how some pe different people handled the same situation, and what is a proper way to handle that situation. So 1 Samuel 13, I'm going to go ahead and start reading verse number 1, and I'm going to read all the way up to verse number 7. Can you hear me out there? All righty, perfect, okay. All right, I'm going to go ahead and start reading in verse number 1, and I'll be reading all the way to verse number 7. This thing really is a distraction. All righty. If you'll just follow along with me, and, uh, and here we go. Verse number one, one says, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash, and in the Mount Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. And the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. And Jonathan, Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Gibeah, and the Philistines heard of it, and Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten a garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel also 
was had in was had in abomination with the Philistines, and the people were called together after Saul and Gilgal. And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Michmash, eastward from Beth Avon, when the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed. Then the people did hide themselves in caves, in thickets, and in rocks, and in high places, and in pits. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and, Gal and, and, Gal and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. This morning we're going to talk about verse 6 there, when the people saw that they were in a strait. You know, straits come in our lives. A straight, by definition, is a narrow passageway. It's a, perhaps a, a difficult situation. We've heard the saying before, they were in dire straits. You know, they were in a position of no hope. And further here in this, per, in this verse of 6, it's in parentheses there, but it says, for the people were distressed. They saw that they had no hope. And what do we do when we're in dire straits or when we're in a strait? Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you, Father, for um, giving it to us. I pray, Lord, that we would give honor to it, that we would treat it, Father, the way it should be treated. And I pray, Lord, that we would seek to learn it as we should, Lord, as, you're, as Christians. And I pray, Lord, that you'd please be with me this morning. I pray, Lord, that you'd please speak through me. Father, uh, we ask that your will be accomplished this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. So here we see Saul had just begun to reign as king. I probably need to stay close to the mic. We see that Saul had just begun to reign as king. He had only been reign he had reigned for a year, and of course, in that year we see that uh, he made the mistake. God had told him, Listen, Saul, I want you to do me one favor. I want you to take care of the Amalekites. And of course, Saul disobeyed. He saved King Agad, he saved the best of the of the animals, and he did not obey God. God's blessing left Saul, said David was then anointed, and here Saul is in his second reign as king, and he begins to form this army. And so he chooses out 3,000 men of Israel. Now these numbers are important to pay attention to, because one, they're in the Bible, but two, it, it brings it into perspective. And so he, Saul here chooses 3,000 men of Israel, and so he divides forces with his son Jonathan, and he gives Jonathan 1,000, and he takes 2,000, and they split up, and they go to fight the Philistines. Now here we find in verse number, uh, verse number 3 that Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Gibeah, and the Philistines heard of it. We find that the victory here was Jonathan. It was the men that was with Jonathan, but Saul blew the trumpet, Saul made it known throughout the land, saying, that, Let the Hebrews hear. And all of Israel heard that Saul had spent the garrison of the Philistines. Just a little interesting, and just an interesting tidbit of the story there, how Saul claimed the glory for that. How, how the glory went to Saul for what was done. And be careful. Be careful when you start seeking glory, and especially for things that you're not doing. Be careful. And all Israel heard that verse saying, Verse 4, that Saul had smitten this garrison. And so all of this goes out. Of course, the Philistines heard that this, that this garrison of theirs had been wiped out. And, and now they're retaliating. And, and you know what? I don't know how big that, that garrison of, of, of Philistines were. You know, I imagine since Jonathan had just a small group of men, just a thousand men, it probably wasn't very big. But the Philistines were coming out loaded for bear. Here you see that they, they have in verse number 5, 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the, shore, on the seashore. That's a lot of men. 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and men as the sand on the seashore. I've never stopped. I've been, to, I've been to the beach a time or two. I've been to places where there's a lot of sand, and I've never tried to just count the sand that's there. You know, if you, if you want to do it and you come up with how much sand is there, let me know. Because I'm really curious to know exactly how much men was there. But you know what? It's just innumerable. And here, the men of Israel look out. Saul brings them all together in Gilgal. And they look out. And they see all of these Philistines. They see all the, 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 the glistening sun off the chariots. They see all of these horses. And they see just men everywhere. And they realized, hey, 
we're not going to win this one. At least that's what they thought. They said, you know what, there's just, there's just no hope. You know what, we are in a straight here. You know what, there's just, there is no way out. And then we see in that verse 6 how the men and how everyone began to respond to this being in a great strait. Now, before we get started about the different responses, be careful on how you criticize some of these people that we're going to look at today. Because I know that problems come to everybody in life. And many a times, whenever a problem comes in my life, you know what I want to do? I want to go to bed and say, hey, this day never existed, and that problem is really not there. And wake up the next morning as if nothing ever happened, but it's still there. We want to hide ourselves. We want to run from it. And so be careful. Be careful how we judge the people in this, in this passage. But verse number six here, we see a group of people and how they handled, how they handled this being in a strait. Seeing this problem that they could not solve on their own, seeing this problem that was bigger than them, being in this position that they did not want to be in. Verse number six, then the people did hide themselves. They ran. They hid themselves in caves, and those ones were probably a little bit smarter. You know, caves are all over the place and kind of hard to get into, and you know, sometimes people don't want to go in there. But the next group is, you know, those people, are, those people were not as bright. They hid themselves in thickets. I'm not sure why they would do that. And in rocks, and in high places, and pits. And some of the Hebrews even went over Jordan to the land of Gad, which I believe is the land of the Philistines. They went over to the enemy lines and went into the country. And you know what? Disguised yourself amongst the people saying, you know what? The war is never going to come over here. I'm safe over here. But you see that these men were fleeing for their lives. They were fleeing for their lives. When this strait came, when this problem came, when this thing that was bigger than them came, they ran. They hid themselves. They said, you know what? I didn't sign up for this. You know, I, I wanted a king. But you know what? Nobody told me that my life would be in danger. I don't know why Saul chose me to be one of his 3,000. He should have picked somebody else. I didn't sign up for this. And they ran. They took off. They hid in the caves. They hid in the thickets. They hid in the rocks. They hid in the high places. This is the first group of people and how they responded to this being in a strait in this situation. Then we find this next group, and this one's, this one's interesting. Verse number 8, And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me. And peace offerings, and he offered the burnt offering, and it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came, and Samuel went out to meet him, that he might salute him. Here we have the first group of men. These were soldiers. These were these were uh, these were fighting men, and they ran, and a lot of them hid. But this next group here, this next person that we see here, is King Saul himself. What did King Saul do when he saw the same problem? Here, here we see that he's looking around and the men are scattered. They're worried. They're saying, Saul, so how are we going to do this? You know what? We don't have the manpower, nor do we have the weapons to defeat this army. You see, later on in the passage, we find these men are getting ready for war, and they don't even have swords. There's two swords in the whole army. Saul has one and Jonathan has the other. All of the rest of them have malls and, and they have different farming equipment. And all of them are heading down to the Philistines to sharpen their axes and to sharpen their mauls to get ready to fight. And so here Saul's looking at this and he's seeing that the men are going everywhere and you know they're not unified and he's thinking, we can't fight a war if we're not together. And so Saul de decides to do the unthinkable. He takes God and everything that he knows is right and brings it into his own hand and says, you know what? I'm going to do what I want to do, and I'm going to do what's right based off of the situation. Now, truth doesn't change, and what's right is always right, but Saul said, you know what? I'm going to do what I feel I need to do in this situation, even if he knew it was wrong. You see, this is what he got in trouble for before. 
Whenever he didn't kill King Agag, whenever he took the animals that he was supposed to kill of the Amalekites and brought them back, Samuel looked at him and said, Saul, to obey is better than sacrifice. To obey is better than sacrifice. And here we find Saul once again in a compromised situation. And what does Saul do? He cans the obeying part. Goes straight to the sacrifice. He says, you know what? Once again, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. Obviously, God does not know what he's doing. Obviously, I need to take control of this situation. And I need to do what I feel is right. And it's time to make a sacrifice. After all, I'm king, right? You know, I'm the most powerful man in the land. You know what? I should be able to do the Lord's work, do what I want to do. And here Samuel said, okay, bring forth the sacrifice. And you see in verse 10, as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, as soon as he had finished it, the man of God walks up. The blood is probably still on him. The, 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 the sacrificing instruments may still be in his hand. And Samuel sees him. I'm sure that Saul knew immediately in that moment, you know what, this was a bad decision. I shouldn't have done this. But you know what? He was in a great strait too. There was a problem before him that he just... He, he, needed, he needed to resolve. He needed to do something. The men were fleeing. And you know what? He wasn't sure what to do. And so you know what? He did what he thought was best. Just like the group before him. They did what they thought was best. They ran and hid. And here Saul makes his sacrifice. Saul, Samuel, of course, comes and rebukes him once again in verse 13. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he hath commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. Saul, Samuel looks at him and says, Hey, Saul, you blew it. That was your last chance. Now the kingdom is going to be taken from you because you chose to take things into your own hands. And Saul arose and got him up to Gilgal and Gibeah and Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people that were present with him. Look at this at the end of verse number 15. The, the men that were present with him, about 600 men. Saul started out in the beginning of the chapter. He had 3,000 men, 1,000 with Jonathan, 2,000 with him. He called everyone together whenever the Philistines started to unite forces. And here he finds himself with a measly 600 men. The rest had taken off. They had skipped town. They're hiding out in caves. They're hiding behind enemy lines. And you know what? I'm sure there's probably even some that when Saul decided to take things in his own hands, they probably thought, you know what? I'm not dying for this man. I'm not doing this anymore. And they took off. And here Saul finds himself in an even more hopeless situation because he did not obey God. He took things into his own hands. He decided, you know what? I'm going to do what I want to do. And I'm going to do this how I want to do it instead of doing things the way God had previously told him. You know what? God may not have said, you know what? This is what you do whenever you have 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and men as the sand of the seashore. God may have not have written out, listen, this is what you do when you're in this situation and you only have 3,000 men. But Saul knew that he shouldn't have sacrificed. Saul knew that that was against what God had said. He knew that that was not his place. And yet he overstepped his bounds. But then again, how do you respond whenever a problem comes in your life that seems hopeless? That you're distressed. You're not sure what to do. And this last part here, chapter 14, we find Jonathan. Now it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan the son of Saul said unto the young men that bear his armor, Come, and let us go over to the Philistine garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father. 
and Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Megron, and the people that were with him were about 600 men. He lost a couple more. And Aya, the son of Ahitib, and Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest, and Shiloh, wearing the ephod, and the people knew not that Jonathan was gone. And between the passages, verse number four is where I'm at, and between the passages by which Jonathan sought to go over into the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And the name of the one was Bozes, and the name of the other was Sina. The forefront of the one was situated, situated northward over against Michmash, and the other southward over against Gibeah. And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come, and let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. Here Jonathan, once again, he was there. He was one of the men of Israel. He saw the 30,000 chariots. He saw the 6,000 horsemen. He saw the men as the seashore. But Jonathan decided to respond a little bit differently. He said, you know what? He said, I'm tired of sitting around all day. He's tired. I'm tired of watching my dad lay underneath this pomegranate tree and not do a thing. And I have one of the only swords, and he has a sword. I have no excuse of why I can't do something. And he takes his armor bearer, and he says, hey, let's, let's go over there. Let's, let's take a look at the Philistine army. And he said, it may be that the Lord will work for us. It may be that the Lord will work for us. He makes this statement to his armor bearer, and then he backs it with, this, with the faith behind it, for he says, there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. He said, you know, there's no limits on God, on who he chooses to use, whether or not they're talented or whether or not there's a lot of people behind them. He said, it doesn't matter. He said, listen. He said, the Lord is God. He has all power. He can save with whoever he wants to. He can use whoever he wants to. He said, it may be that God will save by many or by few. And so they go down there. And he looks at his armor bearer and he says, okay. He said, let's do this. He said, maybe this is not what God wants us to do. He said, but I'm tired of sitting around. I want to do something for God. He said, we're going to go there. Where those two rocks meet? And he said, we're going to look over at the Philistines. And he said, we're going to make ourselves known to them. We're going to let them know that we're there. And he said, if they answer and say, you know what? Wait there, we'll go to you. Then we'll know God is not for us. God's not for this. He said, but if they tell us, why don't you come down to us? Then he told his armor bearer, he said, we'll know that God is with us. And so here, Jonathan and his armor bearer. Now remember that there is only two swords in the whole Israelite army. Jonathan has one, and who knows what his armor bearer has? I mean, I imagine his armor bearer is like, let's go and picks up a rock or picks up a stick or something, because he doesn't have a sword. Maybe Jonathan said, hey, listen, you keep my armor, give me the sword, and I'll go out in front. Or, or maybe he said, you know what, you follow behind me with the sword, I'll knock him down with my armor. I'm not sure. But he said, you know what, it may be that God will save by many or by few. You see, if you looked at Jonathan and his armor bearer, there's two of them against this whole army. If you looked at their weapons, they didn't have modern warfare against this whole army that was, had their swords and chariots and spears and shields. You would have said there's no way. But you know what? It may be that God may save by many or by few. Here, Jonathan is looking at the same problem that all of these other men are looking at. But Jonathan decides to respond a little bit different. And sometimes it just takes one man that says, hey, I'm not going to sit around. I I'm not going to wait until the world passes by before I lead someone to Christ. I'm not going to wait until the gospel goes to my family before, before uh, uh, instead of me taking it myself. Sometimes it just takes one man who says, you know what, I'm going to leave the pack. I'm going to do something different so I can do something for God. Sometimes it's just one man with the faith that God says, you know what, I'll pour my power upon you. I'll magnify you. Sometimes... It's just one man that says, you know what, God? I'm going to give you the room to work because I believe you have the power to do it. 
You have the power to say by many or by few. And you know what? I'm going to go forward trusting that. And you can show me along the way. And so here Jonathan and his armor bearer go to that rock and they're looking out. And they make themselves known to the Philistines. And they said to him, they said, the exact words is this. Verse 12, and the men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, come up to us and we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said unto his armor bearer, come up after me, for the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. And so they go to that rock and they're looking out and they make themselves known. And the men of the Philistines said, hey, come over here. We're going to show you a thing. And I imagine, you know, they're probably taunting them saying, look at these guys. In the previous verses, they said, hey, look, the Israelites climbed out of their holes. Look at them. They're not scared anymore. They said, come over here. We're going to teach you guys a lesson. We're going to show you a thing. And Jonathan looked at his armor bearer unfazed and said, well, God's delivered them into the hand of Israel. Let's go. And so they go down, they descend, and here in just a short amount of time, they kill 20 men in about a half acre of property. And before you know it, the ground begins to shake. God begins to take over. It says here that Jonathan was knocking him over and his armor bearer was, was killing him. And here Saul is still under that pomegranate tree and he noticed there's something happening. He can hear the noise in the background. He can feel the ground shake. And he says, okay, hey. He said, what's going on here? What's going on? He said, uh, somebody go out and number the troops. Make sure everybody's here. And they came back and they said, hey. They said, Jonathan and his armor bearer are not here. That's verse number 17. Then said Saul unto the people that were with him, Number now and see who is gone from us. And when they had numbered, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. Verse 18. And Saul said unto Ahiah, Bring hither the ark of God. For the ark of God was at that time with the children of Israel. And here, Jonathan and his armor bearer begin to work. And they look out and they notice as the army begins to kill themselves. And it says that they begin to fade away. All that sand of the seashore, the 30,000 chariots, the 6,000 horsemen, they're just disappearing. They're killing themselves, they're falling out, they're running. And Saul's wondering, what's going on here? What's going on here? You see here, in all of these different groups of how they, under, uh, how, how they responded to this being in a strait, there's really only two categories. Those who responded in fear and those who responded by faith. Those who responded in fear ran. Those who responded in fear said, you know what? I don't know if God's going to come through. I don't know where Samuel is. I'm going to take things into my own hand. But Jonathan said, you know what? I'm going to respond in faith. He said, I'm just going to trust God. And he said, you know what? I'm going to put myself in a position that God can use me. And he put himself out there. So what do we do? When we find ourselves in a strait, when we find ourselves with a problem that is bigger than us, when we find ourselves without the answers of knowing what to do, first thing we can do is this Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse number six, says this. I'll turn to it if you like, you don't have to find it. Most done here, it says this it says, Be strong. And of a good courage, fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he is, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. The first thing you do whenever you find yourself in a strait, this is what Jonathan did, and we're learning from Jonathan today, is don't fear. Don't give way to fear. Those other men, they let their thoughts get away from them. They let their fear of saving their own life get away from them. And they took off running. Saul thought he would lose everybody, and he started taking things into his own hand. If they would have just silenced the fear, they could have stayed, and maybe they would have been there with Jonathan. Where fear is present, faith is absent. Where fear is present, faith is absent. Psalms 119 says this, or 118, verse number 6 says this. It says, The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What man can do unto me? Understand that when we fear, we take things out of the hands of an almighty God that knows all things. And we say, God, you know, I, I, I don't think you have this under control. I'm going to take it into my hands and I'm going to worry about this situation and I'm going to do the best of my ability because obviously you're not working. 
we take whenever we have fear, faith goes right out the door. You know, you can draw comfort in knowing that God is in control of everything, that God is sovereign, that he knows every hair that is on your head, that he loves you more than anybody on the face of the earth, more than your parents, more than anyone else, and he wants the best for you. So fear not. Fear not. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. The second thing I, I see that Jonathan did was he just simply did right. He obeyed God. He just simply did right. 1 Samuel 15, 22 says this, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken to the fat of rams. So Saul, as Jonathan saw all that was going on. He could have been under that pomegranate tree with his dad. He could have ran with the rest of them. But instead, he just did what's right. He just did what's right. Saul went through the motions, trying to fool those ones around him, pretending that he could do the sacrifice, pretending that, you know what, he was eligible to do all of that. And Jonathan just said, you know what, I'm going to do what's right. Another thing we can learn from Jonathan is his faith. A faith to step out. He looked around and it didn't matter what the crowd was doing. It didn't matter that it was just him and his armor bearer. In fact, you know what? I think he probably knew the state that the army was in and just how everybody was discouraged and downhearted. And he just looked at his armor bearer and said, hey, come on, let's go for a walk. Let's go look out and see the Philistine army. And he said, you know, let me tell you about my God. You know, my God has power to save with a few or with many. He said, you, do you understand the power of my God? He said, he's something. He's really something big. And Proverbs 16, 9 says this, A man's heart deviseth his way, but God directeth his steps. Here Jonathan said, you know what? We need to defeat this army. That's why we're here. That's why I'm in the army. And he said, you know what? I'm not sure how it's going to happen. But he said, you know what? I'm going to figure out a way. A man's heart devises his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. And he said, you know what? But I'm going to leave room there for God to change my course if he desires to. And he said, you know what, God? He said, let them respond this way if you want me to go down. And he simply stepped out by faith, seeking God's direction. I don't know what straight may be in your life right now. What problem is there that is beyond your power to control, beyond your ability to know what to do? And I've found myself a couple times there. And I'd like to say that every time I have answered like Jonathan, and I just went through it, didn't fear, I did what's right, and I set and I sought, or I stepped out by faith to do God's will. But you know, Many a times I found myself in that first category, looking for a rock to hide under, looking for a cave to crawl into. But you know what? A great victory was wrought that day. You know what? The army, I'm sure, talked about it for the rest of their lives of what they saw God do that day. And a great victory was wrought in the hand of Israel. But it all started with one man who said, you know what? I'm going to take this problem and I'm going to do what's right. And I'm, going, I'm not going to fear. I'm going to do right. And I'm going to step out by faith. How will you respond to the straits that are in your life? To those problems, those narrow passages? Thank you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you, Father, for the truths of your word. I thank you, Father, for uh, the change that it has brought in my life. And I pray, Lord, that you please uh, work in my heart. Father, continue to mold me and make me more like you. And I pray, Lord, that you would please take the truths that were taught today and that we would apply them to our lives. Thank you for everyone here this morning. Thank you, Father, for their testimony. I pray, Lord, that you please, if there's one that's in a strait today and a problem, Father, that's bigger than them, I pray, Lord, that they would do what's right. They would seek, Father, to accomplish your will, that they would not fear. Thank you, Father, for who you are. We love you, Lord. And in your name we pray. Amen. All righty. Thank you all for staying awake. We'll see.